how fortunate we are to bring together two people who have been avid seekers of new truth, but from different vantage points. Box has been rooted for nearly six decades in Detroit, particularly its working class African American community. In her time, Detroit has gone from one of the world's great centers of wealth creation, one of its shining models of industrial progress, and one of the vanguard sites for the struggle to raise the workers' standard of living into a site that puts on visible display the pain and decay of an amoral system. Abandoned by multinational corporations which have shifted the locus of production and profiteering to other corners of the earth, Detroiters have been compelled to develop new ways to struggle and survive, to sustain life and build community from the ground up. Wallerstein writes, with a grand sweep of history and politics, spanning multiple centuries and continents, with a command that very few can muster. His ideas have influenced more diverse audiences around the world than most heads of state can even boast. Volume one of his Modern World System has been translated into at least 14 languages. What we shall discover in this conversation is that revolutionary ideas and breakthrough steps towards social transformation can and must occur through thought and action that is grounded in local communities, yet somehow connected on a global scale. This difficult but urgent challenge is one that we shall rest at the feet of our panelists. So let's proceed. The panelists will begin with some personal remarks, followed by an extensive conversation about the state of the world and the struggle to advance humanity beyond capitalism. We will allot one hour for this portion, then reserve the remaining time for audience questions. For the sake of our panelists, please write your questions down on a note card and hand it to one of the volunteers who are collecting them. Can we have our uh, note card volunteers please identify themselves? Find these folks if you need a card and give it back to them and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as, as we can. Uh, so let's again give a please Detroit USSF 2010 welcome to Grace Lee Boggs and Emmanuel Wallace. Okay, Grace will begin. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Emmanuel, for coming to Detroit. I first met Emmanuel Austin on the f first page of the New York Times Book Review in uh, 1975, when his book, Modern World Systems, was reviewed. And I still have my copy of that review. Over the years, I read him, and I quoted him over and over again, particularly in After Liberalism, where he talks about how the old ideas of just workers as a social force, and the worship of science, and the conviction that democracy is just a bourgeois concept. He exploded these ideas, he analyzed them, he helped us to see that we can go very easily get trapped in the past while reality is constantly changing. And then he wrote a wonderful book, I'm sorry we only have 10 copies of it to sell, called Utopistics. And in it he writes that the world of, 18, of the world, 1868, 1968. 1968. Thank you. That in 1968, the ideas that had, we had been living by since the French Revolution had now become outmoded. And he wrote a paragraph which I use all the time. He says, the world of 2050 will be what we make it. You know, there are very few times in history when the free will factor matters as much as it does today. All of us, each of us, had, must live by that conception that the world of 2050 will be what we make it. 
that we have the power within us to change the world. And that's the role that intellectuals can play. Uh, many of you are intellectuals. Many of you are college students. And when you join a revolutionary organization or a radical organization, you're likely to believe that only practice matters, that only action matters. And you become mindless activists living by old ideas. The opportunity to understand what it means to create new ideas as reality changes, I hope you will get from our conversation today. Thank you for coming. I'm terribly, I'm delighted to be here and to be with, J, with Grace Boggs. Grace Boggs is, is someone I've admired and I've known before and I've admired for a long time because she incarnates to me the idea that though the struggle is long, the struggle is also immediate. Uh, that people, everybody, lives in the present as well as in the future and you have to take care of the present if you're going to be any, if you're going to have any realistic impact uh, on the future. So she's tried to combine working always in the presence here in Detroit on, at the local level to do things that will make life better immediately for people who are here and also to try to transform the world in a longer range uh, prospect. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how to do that. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to start with our panelists giving us their sense of how they see the world today uh, and what are the core concepts we need to make sense of the challenges we confront. Uh, I had the great privilege of coming to Detroit in 1953 when Japanese were not producing cars, when the motors, we were still the uh, motor city, motor capital of the world. And I have lived through the Detroit becoming a being, the national, the international symbol of the miracles of industrialization, to it becoming a national and international symbol of the devastation of deindustrialization. And today, you've come here because it's becoming the national and the international symbol of a new kind of society. A society where the gulf between the industrial and the agrarian epoch are being resolved. Not because anyone thought it would be desirable only, but because living at the expense of the earth, living at the expense of the other, other peoples, has brought us to the edge of disaster. And it's up to us. It's that time on the clock of the universe when we face uh, evolution to a higher humanity or the devastation and the, the extinction of all life on Earth. It's a fantastic period. You've probably seen these t-shirts around that say revolution. To understand that revolution is also evolution is what I have learned from my years of practice. Well, but I, the way I approach this is to say, we live, we all live, we all, everybody lives in historical systems. And historical systems do not go on forever. We're living in one that uh, we call capitalism, or the capitalist world economy, or the modern world system. It came into existence about 500 years ago. You have to explain how it came into existence, but we're not going to talk about that today. And then it, it, it goes on. It has a normal life. And you can understand that normal life. You can analyze it. I've been trying to do that. Other people have been trying to do that for a long time. But systems don't go on forever. They, they move slowly, slowly, slowly away from equilibrium until they get too far away. 
And that's, in fact, where the modern world system is today. The modern world system has entered into its structural crisis. It's coming to an end. It's not coming to an end just because lots of people are oppressed and don't like it. That's been true for a very, very long time. It, you know, that's not what's new. What's new is that the system doesn't provide the possibilities in, in its own terms to work. Its own terms is an endless uh, accumulation of capital. It's a kind of crazy system. You run in order to run, in order to run, in order to run. Uh, uh, and it works. It's worked brilliantly. It's worked very well for a couple of hundred years. But it, it's moved way far from equilibrium and you get into what we call a structural crisis. And when you're in a structural crisis, the, the, the alternatives are not only for you who are oppressed or we who are oppressed, but for the people who oppress us. They too don't want, they too see that the system is coming to an end. They too have to worry about what comes next. And that's the long-term struggle that we're in today. It's a struggle in which there are two fundamental sides, not about preserving the present system, but about what will replace it. And, 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 and we're in the middle of that. Grace talked about the free will factor. No, what happens in a, as the system goes on normally, which it did for several hundred years, is that there's a very strong pressure to come back to equilibrium. So no matter how far you sort of push it from, the pressures push it back. And that's what happened to the French Revolution. That's what happened to the Russian Revolution. It isn't that there wasn't an enormous amount of social action and social pressure uh, to, to create something new, but after a while the system pushed it back. Right? That's what we call, usually by the name of determinism. Right? But when a system gets far from equilibrium, that just doesn't work anymore. There's nothing that can push it back to equilibrium. And that's when uh, the so-called free will factor comes in. That's when every little action on our part uh, helps to determine the end. The end uh, that we don't know. You know, that's really terribly important to underline. We don't know who's going to win the struggle of the next 20 to 50 years about the system that should replace uh, and will replace the present system. We don't know. We may win. We may not win. There's no certainty on that. But it all depends on us because who wins is a matter of the addition of everybody's effort at every moment in every part of the world. Uh, and, and the other side, they've got a lot going for them. They've got money, they've got guns, they've got intelligence, uh, they've got power. Right? So they're not going to give up easily. Right? But it doesn't mean that they can't be beaten. Right? And, and that's where we are. We are in the middle of a big struggle about how to replace the present awful system in which we live with one that is better. That's why the, we say another world is possible. I underline the word possible. It's possible. It's not certain. It's possible. That's what's up to us. And well, that's so important to understand the difference between possible and necessary. When I became a radical many years ago, I wanted certainty. I wanted necessity. And I embraced Marxism for that reason. And I'm not an anti-Marxist, but I think we need to look at ourselves and understand that what we're talking about is uncertainty, that revolution is a new beginning. It's not to prove that our analysis was correct. And so many of us as radicals think that's, that's what it's all about. At the end of this book, on the end of the world as we know it, which I recommend, that says that in uncertainty there is hope. I mean, that's a, such a fundamental concept to understand. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know how many of you know other languages, but fortunately I studied German. And so, I look at words, you know, more so critically, to see the difference between the possible and the necessary. 
to know that there is much more hope, there is much more need for our making choices in the possible than in the necessary, that vertical kite is more important than our Wendy kite. My German is very bad, yours is probably much better. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I, what, what I hope folks will get from this is that when you read Martin Wilson's, which is not easy reading, you see that the feudal system came to an end because they could no longer cope with the new realities. And you'll understand what's happening in the Gulf and in the White House and to the stock of shareholders of BP in a way that you will not just from looking at TV. There's a way in which history, which philosophy, in which theory helps you understand reality at a much deeper level. And I hope that's one of the things that you will get out of this conversation. So we, we want to understand uh, why the system is in crisis today, what are the key aspects of that crisis, and what are the key openings and challenges moving towards the future. But I first want to ask our panelists to concretize uh, uh, what do we mean when we talk about this system. People are here at the U.S. Social Forum because they know that there's something, something terribly wrong with the system, um, that there are deep problems with greed and oppression and injustice. But capitalism is not the first system to be rooted in greed and injustice and oppression. Um, so what is specific about capitalism that we need to understand if we're to make sense of, of what the system represents and how we must transcend it? Well, well look, capitalism is a system that is based on the idea that there should be an endless accumulation of capital, an endless accumulation of capital. You accumulate capital in order to accumulate capital, in order to accumulate capital, in order to accumulate capital. You're on this treadmill, uh, or it's, you know, this, what, what, what are those, they call the, the things that uh, the, the rats go on and, <laughs> okay? And uh, it depends on something called growth. Uh, you notice people talking about growth all the time, and they say we, we have to do this and we have to do that in order to ensure growth. Now, growth per se is not a plus or a minus. Uh, cancer is growth, too. <laughs> huh? Huh? You know, uh, so these days in the... Uh, indigenous movements of the Americas, they talk a lot about, it's, it's hard to say it in English, uh, the, they're various, uh, in various languages they have terms, it gets translated into Spanish as buen vivir, to, to live well. Uh, to live well is not necessarily uh, to, ha to endlessly consume. It is, it is in, indeed to make some kind of rational uh, arrangement with the world uh, of the possibilities of, 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 of fulfilling oneself individually and collectively, and that requires uh, restraints as well as growth. Right? So that's the kind of system uh, that that uh, hopefully we we want to create. Now this isn't the kind of system that the people at Davos want to create. Uh, they want to create the kind of system. Uh, it doesn't have to be capitalism. It won't be capitalism. It will be something else. It can be much worse than capitalism. Capitalism isn't necessarily the worst possible system in the world. Right? You can invent worse ones, but it has. Con the capitalist system has the consequence of uh, exploitation, of hierarchy, and of polarization, right? There's been enormous polarization over the last 500 years, and really particularly in the last 50 years. It's been incredible the degree of polarization, the gap uh, between those, uh, not even just the 1%, the 20%. The, the uh, who do reasonably well in the world, and the 80% who don't do reasonably well in the world. Uh, now, that's the kind of system we have at the moment. They're trying to find another kind of system that will do that. I don't know the name of that system. They don't know the name of that system. They'll try to invent it. Uh, we've got to try to invent a different one. But look, 
I've got to talk about the consequences of this for, for, for organizing. The problem is working out a, a strategy that combines a very short run, uh, immediate uh, attempt to solve people's needs and a medium run uh, strategy of transforming the system. I think of the very short run as one of minimizing the pain. Hmm? Uh, minimizing the pain can be done in a thousand different ways. Right? Some of it requires government action, some of it requires popular action, uh, but people need to have less pain immediately. And there are all sorts of ways of doing that. That doesn't transform the world, but it meets people's needs. But then you've got to also explain to people, explain to yourself, that we've got a 20 to 30 to 40 year struggle here, and we've got to think about the things that will transform, that will win this struggle over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years to create the, come out, somehow of the chaotic situation in which we are now, the highly fluctuating system, situation in which we are now, into a new, better order, or a new, worse order. That's, that's the, that's the, but into, there will be some new system emerging at, at, at some point. Uh, it will crystallize. I think it's so important to think about the word system. I know when I became a radical, and some of you are young people who have become radicals in the last period, I thought of the system as something that was something you could race off the blackboard, you know, with the racer. And I thought it was something that was intact. I didn't realize that it was something that people had created because living in a situation of scarcity, economic growth seemed very necessary. And it's so hard, and I, I, I want you to try and think, uh, how do you as theoreticians, or as intellectuals, or as activists, how do you think about change from a very personal way, in the way that uh, people, like for example, in Detroit. In, in Detroit in the 1970s and 80s, all we could see were vacant lots, abandoned room, uh, uh, houses, rot, blight. And some African American women, in particular, who had lived in the South, saw these vacant lots as places where you could grow food to meet a basic need. And they thought, they didn't think basically only in terms of belly hunger. They thought urban kids grow up without a sense of process, without a sense of time that takes time for things to happen. And they thought that urban agriculture would be a means to, for cultural change in young people. And that's how, we, why we're here now, that the urban agricultural movement developed out of that reality, out of the needs of people, very human needs of people. And it's not only in Detroit. Detroit is perhaps the most, I hope, uh, stark example. But in, in, uh, in Milwaukee, Will Allen, uh, uh, my column, by the way, this week in Michigan Citizen is about Will. Will remembered, he's a professional, he's the first African American basketball player at the University of Miami and became a pro. And after he retired, he thought that when he was growing up in rural Maryland, people might have been ragged, he asked, but they had plenty to eat. And so he bought two and a half acres with greenhouses on them in Milwaukee and started growing food. And that has been the inspiration for all sorts of small businesses, for neighborhoods reviving themselves. He, in the May issue of Time Magazine, he's listed as one of the most hundred important people in the world. The First Lady had him at the White House to usher in her new garden. And that's, I mean, that, just, just from Will Allen. I mean, Will, Will Allen could be any one of you. But he, he, out of the understanding of human needs, belly needs, and cultural needs, 
USA Lewis and starts this movement. Well, what Grace is talking about is, uh, look, one of the fundamental aspects of capitalism as a system is what I call the commodification of everything. You want to turn all activities into activities which are done uh, for a profit uh, in order that there be growth and a capital accumulation. Uh, actually, commodification hasn't been all that easy for capitalism. And, you know, up to about 50 years ago, there were lots of things that weren't commodified. Uh, water, by and large, was not commodified. Uh, actually, uh, hospitals weren't commodified. <laughs> and, uh, well, you, you, you jumped. I, I, I wanted to go in between that. Universities weren't commodified. And yes, sex wasn't commodified. Well, it, certain kinds of sex were commodified. But, but, but other kinds were not. And the body wasn't commodified. And what, what you've seen is this mad rush in the last uh, 30, 50 years to commodify more and more and more and more of these things, right? Uh, in order to find a, a last bit of growth uh, as, others, uh, ha as others dry up. Now, one of the things we can do even in the short run is to try to decommodify, right? Not because, I mean, in part to stop this mad <laughs> Thrust, thrust to uh, to madness, but also uh, to test the alternative possibilities of of of, of what will work in a in a more de decommodified world. We don't really know uh, how how it all could work. Uh, we've got to experiment and. That's something we can all do in the short run as part of the uh, uh, process of trying to make the transition uh, from where we are now into this other world which is possible. And we are not alone. I don't know how many of you know a book called Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken. This, the resistance to commodification is a human resistance. It's not something that comes out of a book or kind of comes out of theory. All over the world with the globalization of corporate, corporate globalization, we have resistance developing. People are resisting the commodification of all our relationships. They're resisting the commodification of our environment, of our communities. And that's why you you're, you're here. We are creating a new movement for rehumanization, for a radical revolution of values. I don't know how many of you read Martin Luther King's speech against the Vietnam War, understanding that what he's talking about is how we have been dehumanized by materialism, we have been dehumanized by militarism, we have been dehumanized by consumerism. You, to understand the extent to which that has happened since World War II is something we really need to do. So we won't talk about systems in the abstract. We will know how we become part of the systems and how the movement that we're engaged in is for not only the transformation of institutions, but the transformation of ourselves. Okay, so this is really a key point we need to emphasize, that part of this system is that it's putting a price tag on every resource every human action, even every thought and feeling and emotion. It wants to commodify everything in that regard. And I think what Grace is really emphasizing is that you can see in places like Detroit, not just people growing gardens to feed themselves, give them food they need and to give them the health that's very uh, healthy produce that's very difficult to find in inner city neighborhoods, but to resist this form of relationship that says everything must be uh, bought and sold uh, and everything must be done for the sake of, of a capitalist to profit. Um, I want to switch gears now and talk about the current moment that we're in. Obviously, there's been a huge financial meltdown, a recession. The U.S. is uh, uh, still uh, quagmired in Iraq, and we see even in the headlines today how, how bad things are going in Afghanistan. But uh, 
This is not the first recession or depression. This is not the first war gone awry. Um, what is unique about this moment? When did this crisis begin? And how can we really understand uh, what this crisis represents so that we can prepare ourselves uh, to struggle uh, to change the world? Well, gee, the crisis is, 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 is bigger in many, first of all, it's not a recession. We're in a depression. There's no, let, well, people don't want to use the word uh, as though not using the word will uh, wash it away. Just, just this morning, just this morning, I was reading on the web uh, that uh, one of the things that's been commodified is, is university education. Uh, there never were private profit-making universities before about 30 years ago, right? And there are now a whole batch in the United States. And one of the ways they make money, right, is that they get the students to take out loans uh, which are guaranteed by the government, right? Uh, and uh, which the students uh, not being able to finish those courses for all sorts of reasons, and then they can't pay back their own. And just yesterday, uh, in the U.S. Congress is discussing, right, the next bubble, and the next bubble being the collapse. Of, 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 of the student loans to the private universities, uh, private profit-making universities, right? uh, and whether Congress should, in fact, uh, um, enact various legislation that would uh, stop uh, this kind of thing. What, what we're in is a situation in which the, the choices are impossible because the uh, um, <sighs> The uh, back and forth, uh, the uh, what's the word? I'm I'm blocking on the word. The uh, no, I mean it's it's the up and down of 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 of, of the world market is so rapid. The, uh, the fluctuations. Thank you. Yeah. The fluctuations of the world market are so are so radical that it's impossible at a very short run uh, to predict. If uh, uh, people sit around with piles of money in, in, in various, uh, for example, pension funds. Pension funds, uh, it's your pensions. Lots of you uh, have money in pension funds, right? And they're all invested, right? And they have to make decisions where to invest. Uh, and what ha what's been happening is that the uh, that the money uh, possibilities have been going up and down so fast that they've been losing money, making money, losing money, and they're not sure whether they should put their money into the into dollars or yen or or, or euros or something else. And so they make, of course, mistakes. Of course. And then the governments say, what can we do about it? Well, you know what they do about it. They, what they do is that they cut the pension funds, right? Uh, so that increases the pain enormously, right? But it doesn't solve the problem uh, at all. Uh, and, and, the, and the degree of fluctuation is so hard that people can't make short-run rational decisions. When they can't make short-run rational decisions, they panic. Individuals panic, capitalists panic, all sorts of people panic. If you want to understand right-wing populism in the United States or indeed in Europe or in other parts of the world today, understand it in terms of people panicking. They don't know what, how to protect themselves. They do see that they're in a shaky situation and they lash out at whatever that leads to xenophobia and all sorts of, you, you find the enemy uh, where, uh, you know, where, where, uh, where it doesn't solve any of your problems but it makes you feel better for a few minutes uh, until the next time uh, that it doesn't work. Uh, so uh, that also then explains electoral fluctuations which are going to be uh, tremendous, have been tremendous in the last uh, few years. Um, take, take the whole issue of Afghanistan. Uh, almost everybody is aware at this point, now, almost everybody is aware that the, the war is being lost. The U.S. is not winning the war. NATO is not winning the war. 
personally, McChrystal just uh, was forced to uh, resign. He's been replaced by Petraeus. Okay. Now, people say, the whole discussion in the press, why did McChrystal do such a stupid thing as uh, challenging the president in, a, in, in Rolling Stone magazine, of all places to challenge the president, and so forth. I don't think he did a stupid thing. I, my analysis of McChrystal, he's a very smart fellow, and, he's, uh, and if you watch what he's been doing in the last year, he has done two important things. One, he has, he has set new rules uh, for the American troops, uh, which they don't like which constrain them, tell them to be much more careful about uh, uh, bombing and, uh, and, and shooting and, 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 and so forth. They don't like that. There's lots in the press that they don't like that. The only person who really likes that is Karzai because it protects his, his in interest and his image of the world. And he's postponed at several times going into Kandahar. Now I think Personally, I don't know. I've never met Mr. McChrystal. I uh, have no. I just analyze how his mind must work. I think he said to himself, "It's not going to work," and I don't. I, I don't want to be blamed for that. <laughs> so I'll get myself fired. That saves my personal reputation. Let somebody else lose the war. Get yeah, but I, I think I think that's what's 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 happening there, and I think I think the U.S. is going to have to withdraw uh, uh, in, in the same way that Russia had to withdraw from Afghanistan, in the same way that the U.S. had to withdraw from uh, from Vietnam, uh, which uh, will be a terrible further humiliation for the United States as a geopolitical force, and so forth and so on. But, I, you know, these are unwinnable situations in which there are no good choices for the governments. There are... N uh, just give you another small example which I wrote about in my last uh, commentary. One of the... Everybody knows Spain is in trouble, right? Spain is in trouble, it's got too much debt, and so forth and so on. And what everybody's been telling Spain is you, what you've got to do, the government, you've got to cut down your, your expenses. So you've got to cut your budgets and so forth. The Spanish parliament voted severe, the severest cuts in the history of Spain. And the very next day, the very next day, uh, Fitch ratings downgraded uh, uh, Spain's bonds. And the argument they gave it in writing the argument that they gave is cutting, cutting the, uh, the budget uh, reduces the possibility of growth, which it does. But there it is, damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you don't do it, you're, you're damned because you're, you're spendthrift and allowing the, uh, uh, the budget to get out of hand. And if you do do it, you're cutting the possibility of growth. Well, what do you do if you're a government? Well, you, you don't know. There isn't any good thing to do. And that's what all the governments of all the world, virtually, today, are facing. They don't have a good choice. Whatever they choose, it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. It's a losing game. And then, uh, then voters blame them. Well, they got to blame somebody, and they blame the government in power. And they vote somebody else into power who uh, does what? Well, faced with the same impossible choices. That's the present situation in the world. How do people get on your list to receive your commentary? <laughs> oh, that, 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 that's very easy. You just, um, you, you just write to, uh, what do you write to? You write to... Becky Dunlop? Yeah, you write, you write to Becky Dunlop, uh, or write to me, and I'll, 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 I'll put you on. There, there's no problem. The website of the... Uh, Fernand Braudel Center at, at, at SUNY Binghamton will get you there. So one of the really important points we take away um, from Professor Wallerstein is the idea that liberal reform was done not just because there were some, you know, bleeding heart do-gooders who wanted to help people. These reforms were designed to stabilize the capitalist system. 
right? And to also make people believe that the system worked. And when it wasn't working, it could be fixed. And that's why it's so much in crisis, because those liberal reforms can't work. It's a, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Grace, I want you to talk about what you, from your perspective, see uh, as the key aspects of what this system, uh, what the crisis of the system means, and what you want people to take away from this moment. Well, first of all, I think you, we need to understand why the World Social Forum began in the first place. It began after the Battle of Seattle. You remember when the 50,000 people came out, including teamsters, steel workers, women, young people, and they shut down the WTO. And within a couple of years, the World Social Forum began at Port Alegre, announcing another world is necessary, another world is possible, but they weren't quite clear about where it was happening. And I think it's, it's, I want folks to read the commentaries every couple of weeks that Wallerstein puts out, because it gives you an idea of, you know, it's not that Obama is weak, he may be. It's not that Petraeus is ambitious, he may be. It's because the whole thing has become dysfunctional. And what do you do when something has become dysfunctional? Do you keep demonstrating and hoping that they will become more functional? <laughs> or do you begin projecting and creating alternatives? And where do you look for these alternatives? You look for these alternatives among ordinary people who are trying to satisfy very basic human needs needs for food, needs to know where you are in the, in the, in the world, no, needs to, the need to reassert your human identity. I, I think we can think of the movements of the 60s too much in terms of particular identities, as the identity of blacks or of Latinos or Asian Americans or of women. They're all part of a search for a new human identity. And that's what we're engaged in. And that's what, what I see when you, when, you, uh, have, when, when you think that way, when you understand why movements are created, why new worlds are created, why new systems are created, that shapes what you do with your time. And you have, to, you have to understand it. I mean, you have, it, it's not just something that you know because you're born, you think you're human, and you know everything. You have to be able to think philosophically and historically. And so, because so many of you here are young people who are in university and are trying to figure out what should you do with your mind? Does your mind have a role? Is it important to think and not just to act? And I, I just want to bring to your attention an essay by Starhawk. I don't know how many of you know it. It's called Burning Times. You can find it on the Bog Center website, by the way. It was www.bogcenter.org. What Starhawk did was she analyzed what happened in the witch hunts of the 17th century how people like Bacon, Francis Bacon, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer in England, how they inaugurated these witch hunts in order not only to expropriate the land of the peasants, but the knowledge of women, the intuitive knowledge of women. And how we have this fantastic challenge, not only to begin growing our own food, the way that peasants do, not wondering how much we're going to be paid each hour for that work, and also for rethinking how we appreciate reality, how much we're willing to live in the present and to think of the present as well as with a historical perspective. And we, this is, we, you know, this is time not only to act, but to think to understand that philosophy is not 
an abstraction only, that philosophy is a way of thinking. That we can think with our hearts, or we can think only with the left side of our brains. And we're learning so much from neuroscience now about how our brains are much more complex and how knowledge is a much more complex thing than we have understood before. So there's a lot that's important about theory, knowledge, study. I urge you to come to the Another Education is Necessary, Another Education is Possible workshop this afternoon. Bill will be there, and Bill is back there, and Shay Howell, and Nate Walker, who I saw come in just a few minutes ago, and I also. How are we going to talk about another education? How are we going to talk about education in the way that freedom schools conceived of education during Mississippi summer? As not, as a way not just to learn something so that you could regurgitate it on a test and become a part of the Pentagon or one of the, one of the think tanks in Washington, but how to use education to serve our community, to, to, for each of us to become full-fledged full -fledged citizens. How we can do that from K to 12 and up in higher education so that we create in this country what we have the opportunity to know, a more participatory democracy. This you know, democracy, representative democracy, emerged a couple of hundred years ago with the nation state. We are now in the period where the nation state, who is the nation state? What is its relationship to the world? And we, we have a democracy which is, is obviously dysfunctional in Washington and elsewhere in the world. And we, we have the challenge to create another democracy. And I believe that it can be done on the school level. We start at kindergarten to involve parents and teachers and children in this other education as possible. I urge you folks to come to this workshop. I think it's really important that the role which labor played in the movements of the 30s is now played by the people who are involved in education. And that involves parents, it involves children, it involves teachers. Because education is the creation of human beings. And what's important to us today is not the manufacture of things as much as it is the creation of people. I'd like to pick up on the, uh, uh, after Seattle came the World Social Forum. There's something very different about the World Social Forum from all previous attempts uh, at changing the world. Up to 1968, all the major anti-systemic movements, whether they were the communists or the social democrats in the countries where they were strong or the national liberation movements, they all were hierarchical organizations which believed that they should be the only organization, the only organization uh, in their country, right? And that all other kinds of organizations had to be subordinated segments of them. If there were a women's group, it should be a women's group of the labor movement or of the Communist Party or of the National Liberation Movement. If there were a youth group, if there were a, uh, a, an ecology group or a peace group, all of that had to be part of the one, the single movement which was hierarchical and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and which stood for the revolution, because after the revolution, everything would be better, right? Now what 68 did, or 1968, all over the place, was to end this sense of, uh, of, of the single hierarchical movement as the only movement. And 
We fiddled around with a lot of alternative possibilities. I won't go through them all. But we came up finally after 30, 40 years with the World Social Forum. What is the World Social Forum? World Social Forum brings together movements, a whole range of movements, right? From what might be considered just left of center reformist movements to wildly uh, revolutionary movements uh, and of all kinds. Uh, uh, there, uh, first of all, all kinds in terms of their scope. Some of them are local, some of them are national, some of them are regional, some of them are international, and then there are all kinds in terms of their focus. Some of them are uh, labor movements, some of them are, are, are women's movements, some of them are uh, gay and lesbian movements, some of them are e ecology movements, you name it, uh, they show up at the World Social Forum. And what does the World Social Forum say that should happen? Well, the first thing that should happen is that they should talk to each other and not denounce each other. And maybe by talking to each other, they'll begin to appreciate things that they didn't understand themselves in terms of their own movement and, uh, and begin to understand the possibilities of cooperative political action on specific things or general things with these other movements. Uh, and I think myself, I'm a great believer in the World Social Forum, I think it's been a remarkable success. People talk about how it hasn't been a success, how, how, how the world hasn't been transformed. Well, it isn't true that the world hasn't been transformed. You know, the United States Social Forum didn't exist in the 1990s. It wasn't even a thinkable possibility, right? And here it is, you're, we're in the second one. And, and there are European social forums, and Asian social forums, and African social forums, and there are regional social forums, and thematic social forums. It's, it's a growth industry, if there's a growth industry. <laughs> right? And they're different, they're different, and they argue. Right? And there are people who are unhappy about this and unhappy about that. And if you've, at least at the level of the World Social Forum, they've been tinkering with the, with the way they're being, they've been run. Uh, at each meeting, it's, it's a little bit different because of the criticisms of how it was run in the previous meeting. And we've been improving the process. Now, there's some people who say, yeah, but where's the action? And the action is, well, the action is where we make the action. It isn't in the meeting of the World Social Forum or in the meeting of the United States Social Forum, but there's action. Uh, and a lot of that action is the consequence of the networking uh, that was made possible by the Social Forum. So uh, I, I think we've got a very strong mechanism here. Uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't perfect. Um, and uh, um, who knows, maybe five years from now they won't exist anymore and we'll replace them with other things. I don't know. It's, a, it, it's, it's an uncertain world and we're in an uncertain situation and we're feeling our way all the time, but we build uh, 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 on the positive, and so far, this meeting has been positive. The World Social Forum is. Uh, I hope some of you are going to be able to get to the Dakar meeting in 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 February. Uh, 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 February is no. It's the end of uh, end of January. Uh, uh, it's. It's February, right, it's the first week of February in Dakar. Um, uh, um, it's the second one in Africa, it's an important one. Um, and I, I, I think we're going to be able to move forward from there. You know, uh, Emmanuel was at the uh, Port Alegre. He's at Mumbai, I don't know how many others he's been. I haven't been to those, but we're so fortunate that he's here for hours. The, and the, and the uh, uh, U.S. Social Forum is a process. They're trying to learn from each one to go to the next. And that's uh, uh, also, by the way, I, I like, Melissa Young and Mark Dawkin, who had this group called Moving Images, have made a wonderful 20-minute uh, the uh, film of the, was it the first or the second, Melissa? Second. Second. Of the, it's a really marvelous 
uh, uh, film. It's just 20 minutes and it's moving images. Okay, we're going to get to the questions uh, in just a minute, so please prepare those and hand them to the volunteers. Grace, I just wanted to get you to respond to uh, uh, Emmanuel's last point about changing concepts of revolution. You've written a lot about how we have to see revolution as not a one-time event that solves everything, but a protracted process, and that everything we do is about uh, creating the new relations that go into a social transformation. Could, so could you speak more about what is most important about new concepts of revolution? Well, I, most people still have in their minds the sort of hierarchical concept of revolution that came out of the insurrection of 1917. And they haven't thought enough about what's happened since 1917, how those who capture the state become prisoners of the state. And we haven't seriously enough, I think, as radicals, discussed and internalized the changing concepts of revolution. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure a lot of you know Gramsci. And you know that how he uh, said that the, that we have wars of movement and wars of position, and how during we are in a period where we must see ourselves not as capturing the state, but as developing the ideas that will replace the ideas of the system. Because the ruling class rules not only through force, as Scott was saying, but through its hegemony, its cultural hegemony. So as intellectuals, we have a really serious challenge. How do we create the new ideas? That are this? How do we create alternatives? How do we get beyond op op oppositional thinking and all the anger that is involved in oppositional thinking and that really bogs us down? And how do we really understand that revolution is a new beginning? It's not a new beginning in terms of economic systems and how we make our living, but it's a new beginning in how we think and how we become more human. Each revolution is an advance in our concept of what it means to be human. And back in 1917, they couldn't help being thinking in a hierarchical way. And in the White House, they can't help thinking in a hierarchical way. The only way they can solve the education crisis is to have more testing and more punishment. Yeah. They're not able to think of another way of education that will make us all more participants in creating our world and in governing our world. So all this, these are enormous challenges that we face. And I think if we come out of this U.S. social forum with one thing, we should feel enormously challenged. We become more theoretical as well as more practical, more imaginative. Okay, and on that point, we will now recite the Communist Manifesto line by line and sing the International. <laughs> Actually, Grace does want to cite, before we get to questions, Grace wants to cite one passage from the Communist Manifesto. My favorite passage from the Communist Manifesto. By the way, I don't know how many of you know how young Marx was when he wrote the Communist Manifesto. Do, I, I did a translation of Marx's economic philosophical manuscripts in 1843, many, many years ago. And I was able to identify, because I was relatively young, I was able to identify with him as a young man. And I know the things that you want when you're young. But he wrote a marvelous passage in the Communist Manifesto, which starts with the paragraph that starts with the constant revolutions, revolutionizing of technology, as of that which distinguishes the bourgeois epoch from all previous epochs. And that ends with these words, which I love and I, I will quote all the time. All that is solid melts into air. All that is sacred is profaned. And man, woman, is compelled to face with sober senses his conditions of life and his relations with his kind. And that's where we are.
Okay, the questions have uh, come in, so let's try to get to as many as we can. Uh, first question is, please comment on the role of creativity as part of moving toward a more humane world. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, I mean, uh, uh, actually, uh, Prigogine in his, in his book on, uh, on the end of certainties uh, says very clearly that if, you, if, if the world were, in fact, uh, uh, totally determined, there would be no place for creativity. It's the, it's the reality of uncertainty that creates the possibility of creativity uh, and that, uh, the, how shall I say, the human trajectory has been one, uh, the, not merely the human trajectory, the, the physical trajectory of the, of the whole history of the world has been one of constant bursts of creativity. Uh, creativity uh, is, 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 is the center of possibility. Uh, and, and we should celebrate it. Uh, and, 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 and that compensates you, if you will, for this sense that I don't know for sure what's going to happen tomorrow. No, you don't know for sure what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's good, as Grace just said. That's good. Uh, the, uh, I, I can't remember when it was I said this, but I, I quoted this at one session I was speaking, how Einstein said the splitting of the atom changed everything but the human mind, and thus we drift toward catastrophe. And at the same time, he, he talked about imagination being more important than knowledge. And I think we need to understand the difference between imagination and knowledge, how knowledge is of the past. It's of concepts that have been already created from realities that have changed and how imagination begins to project the future. And I, I don't know how many of you were at the session last night, the plenary, but one of the things that we did in Detroit uh, in 1992, in response to Coleman Young's saying that casinos were necessary to create jobs and calling us a bunch of naysayers, because we opposed them. We created Detroit Summer to involve young people in rebuilding, redefining, and respiriting Detroit from the ground up. That's an act of an imagination. That's an act of creation. That's the kind of organizing we need to do. We need not only to oppose people like Coleman Young for proposing casino gambling, but we need to be protecting alternatives. We are at that time in the clock of the world when projecting alternatives, new positives, are, are what we need to do because that's where the world is. Not only where we are, but we have to be where the world is. Okay, the next question is, uh, the idea of American democracy is deeply rooted in the work of the great peacemaker founder of the Iroquois Confederacy. He brought the warring tribes together into an alliance of prosperity. Can we not look to their work for inspiration to solve our economic challenges? Uh, I don't know how many of you do American history, but one of the things that Jimmy and I began doing after the rebellions of in the 1960s was we tried to rediscover the American past. And in the course of it, we not only began to understand how the democracy of, that was created by the US Constitution was a, a democracy of its time, a representative democracy, but also how this country and we, all of us in this room, have obtained our comforts and conveniences to which we feel we have a right through the exploitation of other peoples and of the earth. And how the next American revolution has got to be a revolution very different from previous revolutions. That countries that had very little 
and the revolution want more. Our revolution needs to be giving up things in order to advance our humanity. And in order to save the earth. And as Jimmy wrote in the, the book, Did I go out? Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century, which we wrote in 1974, and which has been reprinted recently. Until we recognize this and acknowledge this, we are going to face terror. And that's the meaning of 9-11. If we want to get rid of fear, we want to get rid of terror, we have to acknowledge how we have gained our comforts and conveniences. We have to understand the negativity that is an economic growth and accumulation and accumulation and accumulation. Okay, uh, the next question is, isn't this actually a social conjecture of the global structural crisis? Capitalism and the rise of socialist or radical democratic alternatives. How do you see uh, the Venezuelan socialism for the 21st century? Alba, uh, the Bolivarian communitarian socialism. I think maybe we'll ask uh, uh, Professor Wallerstein to address it. The Latin America in the last 10 years, basically, since about 2000, uh, has had a remarkable series of elections in which various versions of governments left of center, some further left of center than others, have come to power. Uh, how come? Uh, in part because of what's going on in Latin America, and in part because the U.S. didn't have the energy, political, military, and economic energy to handle the situation in the ways that they historically did because they were giving such enormous priority to the issues in the Middle East that they hadn't got anything left over to handle properly. As a result, we had these governments come to power. Uh, Venezuela is one version. Um, Ecuador is another. Bolivia is a third. There are none of them the same as each other. Um, Brazil has been a fourth. Um, incidentally, the latest poll in Brazil just yesterday shows that uh, um, Lula's candidate, Dilma Rousseff, who was way, way behind six months ago, has pulled to, to a significant lead over the principal other candidate uh, of the right. Uh, so we're going to have probably uh, a, a second Lula government through Dilma Rousseff. This changes the geopolitical situation in the world in a positive way. There's no question that the sense of uh, Latin American autonomy as a geopolitical entity uh, is a reality today. It's not a, it's not a possibility, it's a reality. Uh, yes, I know the U.S. Uh, or, uh, that we had a right-wing uh, coup in, in, in Honduras, and yes, in, in Colombia, uh, this terrible guy just won the elections uh, and so forth. But basically, if you look at Latin America as a whole, it, uh, it is now an autonomous actor on the world political scene. That is very positive. No question about that, because it, it entrenches the reality of a multipolar world in which we are living, and that limits considerably uh, the ability of the United States or of Western Europe uh, to engage in all kinds of activities which they uh, traditionally have done or wish to do still. Uh, they have instituted in their countries various versions of 
let's face it, let's call it social democracy, of various versions of it. Is this transformative? No. Is this minimizing the pain? Yes. Um, that's my view of Alba. Um, Grace, how do you relate to what's taking place in Latin America? Well, uh, I think it's important, but I'm more interested in the question that was asked originally about what is socialism. I think we need to ask ourselves where the concept came from, how the utopian socialist socialism of the early 19th century was replaced by the scientific socialism of Marx and Engels, and how Marx saw socialism as part of a sequence toward communism. It would be the stage at which workers took power in order to deal with the distribution and so forth of goods in a different way from the capitalists. And if you're not a, if you're a socialist, if you're not a socialist, you're a knave. I mean, if you don't believe that we should have more human relationships between among ourselves, you're a knave. But if you're still a socialist, you're a fool. And that's, well, that's because you're not thinking historically enough. You're not thinking that the world that we're living in is not the world of Karl Marx. That Marx was born in 1819, that he grew up in a Europe where there was a great deal of scarcity, where he was concerned with economic growth, you know, naturally and humanly, but we're not. So we can't use the same words with the same sort of naivete that we tend to. Every concept has a historical origin. It's born at a particular time out of the creativity of intellectuals and of, of people. And we have to create our own views of the revolutionary change that's required. What we do know is it's not going to be hierarchical in the way it's been in the past. We know it's not going to be patriarchal in the way that it has been in the past. We know it's not going to involve the same industrialization and lack of contact, contact with the earth as it has been in the past. We know a lot of very fundamental things about it. And we have to find out how to recreate those fundamentals through practice of the theory. Well, the way I usually answer that question is to say that the world which I want and which I think the world we should want is a world that is relatively democratic and relatively egalitarian. That's not the kind of world we have now. That's not the kind of world we have ever had. Hmm? Uh, what the institutions will be that will uh, maintain a world that is relatively democratic and relatively egalitarian, I don't think we know. I often say if people were sitting around in the late 15th century and saying, oh goodness, feudalism is coming to an end and it's going to be replaced by capitalism, <laughs> what kinds of structures will this capitalist system have? How many of them could have, in 1450, imagined the kinds of structures which over 500 years were developed in the capitalist world economy in order to maintain the system and allow it to function and allow it to um, meet its, ob uh, its, its objectives, right? So I don't think we can sit around and say that in the, in the 20 second century and the 23rd century, there are going to be structures of the following kind which we'll, we can give a name to, we can call it socialist, we can call it anything we want, right? Uh, that will fulfill uh, this need. What we can say is we've got to push in, we've got to set it up on a certain uh, fundamental thrust 
And that thrust is to say, we want a system that's relatively democratic and relatively egalitarian. I use the word relatively because it's never going to be perfectly. There ain't no such thing. But we can do a lot, lot better than we have done historically in the capitalist world system. I don't think we have a single democratic country in the world, and I don't think we ever have had. We certainly haven't had any egalitarian country in the world, including those that call themselves socialist. So, uh, so creating one will be hard and something very new, and we've got to sort of push in the right direction. We can't do more in the year 2010 than push in the right direction. Uh, and it, it's, it's vain to think we can. So is Venezuela establishing 21st century socialism? I don't believe that. I don't believe they can. Uh, with the best will in the world within Venezuela create 21st century socialism. Are they doing things that push in the right direction? Yes, for the moment, but we have to evaluate that as we have to evaluate uh, what's going on everywhere in every way. But push, we can, uh, so that when uh, in, in, in China uh, workers push for a better deal, that's a good thing. That's a good thing just as it is a good thing if they do it in Detroit, right? And it's pushing in the right direction and I don't care what the name of the government is. One of the things that I quoted from uh, Emmanuel earlier was where he said in after liberalism that democracy is not just a bourgeois concept. Just think about that, how we are participants, we are creators of a more enriched, a more expanded concept of democracy. That the democracy that was created in the era of the nation state is not the democracy that we need today. That the Chinese, with all their limitations, think they're creating a new democracy. They call it vertical democracy, which has a combination of control from the state and also listening to the grassroots. But what is important is not our critique of the Chinese vertical democracy, but the understanding that democracy is now a concept in, in, in contention, and that we are all participants in creating what we think should be the democracy of the future. Okay, our next question, uh asks us to focus primarily on the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, it is, would you say that we are closer to true social revolution slash transformation now versus when you first began organizing? And I want to put this question into context by pointing out that uh, Grace Lee Boggs was born in 1915 during World War I on June the 27th. Now, June 27th is Sunday, and we know, unfortunately, while some of you will be staying in our wonderful city, many of you have to go back to your own struggles and your jobs in your own hometown. So we've decided, since you're all here, we're going to have a birthday party for Grace tonight, right here. So we want you to attend the plenary tonight right here in Cobo Hall and stick around. Right afterwards, we'll be in the Riverview room of this building, right on the, on the main level. Okay. You can come early to buy your books and t-shirts, to sign up to receive Grace's uh, weekly commentaries. Actually, he does a weekly one. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, here for uh, the social forum and Grace's birthday is another uh, movement elder. Uh, is Vincent Harding in the room? Can we please acknowledge Vincent Harding? Do you want to? 
I've known Vincent for over 45 years. I don't know how many of you know that he wrote the first draft of Martin Luther King's anti-Vietnam War speech. <laughs> that he worked very closely with MLK, whom we all call Dr. King, or Martin Luther King Jr., he calls Martin. <laughs> uh, the, I think it's important that there are elders here with all you young people. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> the future belongs to you, but we've played a role in creating it. We also know that Danny Glover is making every effort to fly uh, Duty shirt, he's here, uh, to be with Grace uh, for the party as well. So we want all of you to join us in a, in a spectacular 95th birthday party for Grace tonight. Um, okay, so back to the question. Uh, are we closer to social transformation now than when you first began organizing? What do you see that looks like progress toward our goals, especially in light of a perceived mainstream trend uh, towards the right, towards conservatism? Well, there's a, there's a trend towards the right, there's a trend towards the left. Now, if you want to know what I see, I see the United States Social Forum. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 see, I see that nobody is safe from criticism. The, the Bolivian government, which is the first government run by uh, uh, an indigenous person in the Americas uh, and is committed to a plurinational society is, is now struggling with uh, a critique from uh, uh, one indigenous uh, group who thinks uh, uh, that they uh, that the uh, that the Bolivian government is engaged in neo uh, developmentalism. Uh, it's a it's a it's a tricky, difficult issue, and they're struggling with it. But the point is, they're not safe from criticism. That's a great plus. It really is. Well, I mean, you all are, are the evidence that we are closer to a new society than we were when I joined the movement nearly 70 years ago. When I joined the movement in 1941, the ideas that dominated the radical movement were the revolution of 1917. The big struggle was, is the Soviet Union still a worker state? Is it a degenerated worker state? Is it state capitalism? We argued about other countries. And the models from the American Revolution came from elsewhere. And to, di to this day, many radical organizations still use foreign models. We have not, we did not have any sense that the US Revolution would be very different from other revolutions. And I think it, we owe so much to the generation of the 60s who carried on the anti-Vietnam War struggles, who carried on the women's struggles, who carried on the civil rights and black power struggles, because they made the possibility of an American revolution and the need for an American revolution a reality. Before that, it was very hard to have any idea of an American Revolution. I remember, by the way, I was in Cuba in 1966, and I heard Fidel Castro talk, and he said a wonderful thing. He said, we are not a communist country, we are not a socialist country, but we're a socialist country with communist spirit. <laughs> and, you know, the... the the, how, how our spirits develop. This is the workshops being carried on at this social forum talking about bringing spirituality out of the closet. <laughs> I think we have a very much more enriched idea of what it means to be a human being at this time on the clock of the world 
than we had when I became a radical. And I don't think you can become a revolutionary unless you have a very enriched idea of the human spirit. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I think that was Kari from Oklahoma. Uh, to follow up on that, the next question is, anger can be a powerful motivating force, but how do we move from anger to compassion? How, if at all, can compassion and love be powerful motivating tools for social change? I'd love to hear what you think of that. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Anger can be a powerful tool. It can also be a, de de uh, a, a disarming one and a debilitating one because it'll lead you to strike out at, uh, how shall I say, not necessarily the real enemy, uh, but whoever is closest at hand. Um, uh, anger has to be tempered by, what shall I say, cold analysis because that then leads you to compassion. Uh, that, if you try to put yourself in the place of the other person, if you try to figure out how did that other person ever come to feeling the way they claim to feel or seem to feel, huh? uh, it, really, it really leads you to both to understand your own limitations and to understand what's going on and make sense of how to deal with it. And, and at that point, uh, compassion. I mean, you know, I have to say that even some of the most terrible people uh, have from their own point of view uh, motives that, that that seem reasonable to them uh, and uh, they don't understand their own limitations. So that's how I, I deal with this. Well, I think we are not conscious of the degree to which our society has moved us to other other people and how we've lost that which has been part of why the human race has evolved. That sense of that we are, as uh, Gwendolyn Brooks put it, we are each other's business, we are each other's harvest. That, that sense of that, that, and it goes back to an epistemology, a theory of knowledge, that is not just of the brain, but of the heart. An epistemology of compassion, a epistemology that recognizes how we belong to each other, how we are each other's harvest, each other's business. I mean, it's, it's, you know, to be at that time on the clock of the universe when we can make that huge change from othering other people to feeling that they are part of us and we are part of them. That's a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful time to be alive. Okay, we've had a number of uh, audience members who are asking questions about the nonprofit sector. Um, so uh, I think... <laughs> This one is just an example of many questions. Uh, many social justice nonprofits are moving away from foundation funding to grassroots funding models. But this still seems like uh, an overdependence on money for our movement, um, money for our movement work, and a lack of acknowledgement of the economic conditions. What do you think about nonprofits? Uh, and these times, and their relationship to building alternatives to capitalism. So do nonprofits help us develop the alternatives to capitalism, or are there some problems with them that we need to think about? You mean by nonprofits, you mean NGOs that are uh, like foundations? Foundation-funded and 501c3. Foundation and, 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 
I, I was in a workshop yesterday uh, run by Progressive Omaha, a group I'd never heard of. Uh, and they're a local group in Omaha. And the topic was uh, how, do you, how do you run a movement on no money or, or virtually no money. And so uh, there were about 30, 40 people there. And there was a man and a woman from Progressive Omaha who were explaining what they do and all the kinds of things they figured out how to do that either cost nothing or cost extremely little but were effective in organizing and then other people from the audience, uh, from the participants, came in with their stories of what they did in, in, in their community uh, on, 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 on next to nothing. Um, so, okay, um, uh, and uh, it's admirable, and uh, uh, you know, Omaha, Nebraska is not the center of the radical movement in the United States. Um, so, uh, obviously, uh, they were doing something that, that, that was useful. Um, we probably all can do many things on less money than we think, but on the other hand, uh, you know, if you're going to come from, uh, I don't know, uh, Los Angeles to Detroit for a meeting, somebody's got to pay for the, for the plane ticket or, or even if you take a, a car for the gasoline or, or, or whatever, uh, and you may have to raise money somehow. So where do you raise the money? And you can raise it from other poor militants. Uh, sometime, <laughs> or sometimes you can raise it from uh, one of these nonprofits. And is there a price to pay? There are always prices to pay. You know, there are prices to pay uh, any time you take money from anybody. But uh, you can balance that, and um, uh, it's a matter of navigating a difficult situation. Look, the World Social Forum has this. Uh, magnified, right? Here we're going to have a meeting in Dakar, getting to Dakar, even from the United States, but let's talk about from, from Chile or from Malaysia or from Korea. It's an expensive proposition. It, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not pennies. Uh, first of all, for the, for the plane ticket, because you've got to come by plane. Right? Uh, yeah, unless you're in an absolutely neighboring African country, perhaps. Uh, and then, you know, just staying in Dakar, Dakar, I, I know Dakar, it's an expensive city. It's, in fact, one of the more expensive cities in the world. So you've got to buy the food and, uh, and uh, pay for the housing and so forth. Somebody's got to pay. So we wrestle with that. At the, so should the World Social Forum accept? Uh, money from, I don't know, the Ford Foundation or somebody else like this. And, and then there are people who say, yeah, but that's terrible. You know, they have this agenda and that agenda. Uh, and, and, and so then you say, well, where should they get the money? Or they don't come, right? You get very small delegations, right? Um, <coughs> there's no good solution. There's no good solution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you take a little from here and a little from there and you play one off against the other and you, you, you know a long time ago an African leader it was before independence said uh, uh, when they try to bribe you take the bribe and then do what you want <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, I, 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 like, like Emmanuel, I'm trying to see this from the point of view of the young people, many of whom, as they left college, said, I want to become a community organizer. I, I don't want to. I've reached success, academic success, and I can go to the White House, I can go to D.C., or I can go to a community and do what I believe in, what I hope for. And I see young people took grants from non-profit organizations in order to do that. It seemed better than becoming part of the rat race just to pay off your college loans. 
But it has its limitations, obviously. But that's and, where compassion comes in. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what has happened right, right now in, in Detroit, for example, we see nonprofit organizations partnering with Bing and Bob in order to cut, shrink our city and close down our schools. And we have to fight them. I, I know some lovely people who are uh, who head nonprofit organizations and work for nonprofit organizations. But we're at a very different time, and the tendency, what, what I've seen happen is that one begins to get a million dollars from a, from a nonprofit organization, and you develop a certain style of organization, and people who are in the community begin looking at your organization quite differently. So it's a, it's a very complex question. Right, we're at the Bog Center, for example, which doesn't have grants. Out of your coming here to the US Social Forum, we're making so many social contacts. There is so much opportunity to organize to create, to expand our network, we're going to have to decide, are we still going to be holding out, you know, passing around buckets, as we will do tonight? <laughs> <laughs> or will we solicit a grant to do what we have to do? I don't know. I'm not going to decide that. <laughs> So, and I do want to say, this is a topic uh, that Grace and I take up in chapter six of our book, The Next American Revolution. And the real point we're making is that these institutional settings will change and we'll have to be very flexible there. But the values, the values that, that we apply have to be consistent. The values of solidarity economics, I think, have to be a core, at the core of our actions. Um, so, on the University of California Press in early 2011, look for The Next American Revolution by Grace Lee Boggs, and look for volume four of The Modern World System uh, by Emmanuel Wallerstein. And don't forget your copy. <laughs> called Reclaiming the Organic Intellectual, which you can get at the Boggs Center table. I really wish you would look at it because it helps you to find what the role of an intellectual is. Okay, we have time for just maybe a couple more questions. Um, what is your vision for the world of 2050? Thank you. Well, it's exactly what I said in the beginning. We'll be, I'm pretty sure, in the year 2050, we will talk of capitalism as a system of the past. But what is my vision? My vision is I don't know. You know, uh, in uh, people who discuss chaos theory, there's the, there's the uh, concept of, uh, of the butterfly flapping the wings, right? The butterfly flaps the wings over here and at the other end of the world, the, the climate changes in, in all sorts of ways because that's the impact of one butterfly flapping its wings. And I like to say, we're all butterflies. We're all flapping our wings every minute, not, not just once, every minute, it's a different situation and we're flapping our wings and it depends on how many people flap their wings in the right direction. So it's up to you, right? If, if enough of us flap our wings repeatedly, constantly, uh, pushing in the right direction, we might win out. Uh, it's 50-50. It's I always say it's 50-50, it's but I think 50-50 is a lot, not a little, right? And uh, so go, but, but, but for God's sakes, don't think that it's certain. It's not certain, not at all, and in 2050, you might be living in a miserable world. So it depends on how many of us flip our, wing, uh, flip our wings in the right direction.
<laughs> no, I don't need to add to that. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to have time for two more questions. Uh, second to last question. Uh, we'd appreciate if people could, could, could uh, keep the noise down. How do we dismantle white supremacy distinct from our efforts to replace capitalism? Well, it isn't distinct. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> capitalism as a system is racist. Its racism is inherent. <laughs> but, you know, in that worse world that we might be living in in 2050, we'll, we'll still be racist. And if, if, if we're still racist, uh, or if that's a, 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 a defining feature of the system we replace, we haven't improved things an awful lot. So, I mean, you know, uh, we've got to tackle the thing and tackle it directly. And, you know, racism is a, a problem not merely in its most egregious uh, manifestations of outright uh, discriminations of various kinds and terrible treatments, but within, it's a layered thing, right, uh, in, 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 in which uh, the world is defined as being not in a simple two-layer thing, the good people up here and the bad people down there, but a whole series down and, 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 and everybody is uh, often uh, being racist about the group that's defined as slightly lower on the, uh, uh, on the thing. So racism is within the movements. I, I was in the middle of a discussion in South Africa, uh, only, what was it, a year or two ago, uh, it was a meeting of organizations, of grassroots organizations, all good people, right? Uh, and in the middle of this meeting, one person got up uh, from some grassroots organization and said, the problem was all those Mozambicans and Zimbabweans who are in this country. <laughs> right? And that was racism, it was xenophobia coming out right from within the movements. Right? So, I mean, it's pervasive. It's, 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 and you've got to attack it. But you've got to attack it systematically. You've got to attack it in all its manifestations. You can't... Uh, you can't have uh, an assumption that there are some people that are somehow outside uh, the legitimate range of, uh, of participation. Uh, during the Obama campaign, uh, some of the staff members from Obama's campaign came to meet with some of the members of the Bach Center. And what we tried to tell them, I think, applies here. You need to get the young people talking to their parents. As a way in which young people have decided our parents are hopeless. <laughs> but they're the ones I mean, who are part of this right-wing movement. They have lost their middle-class way of life, their hopes for a middle-class way of life. They see no future. All their children do is rant and rave at them as rightists and conservatives and unfeeling people. But they care about you. And I think if we look at right-wing people as the, as the Tea Party people, not so much. We have to understand their uh, 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 force at this moment that we are in the world of good Germans of the 1930s. But they are also human beings. And our challenge is to weaken the opposition, not to strengthen it by hurling epithets at it. There's a lot we can do. There's a lot that can be done right in this room to weaken the right wing. If we understand it, if we understand it, it's because the United States is 
in a very terrible state in the world. I mean, it's, it's much the same situation as Germany was in the 30s. A losing war, several losing wars, unemployment, no vision of a future in a nation that has prospered by virtue of hope and belief that the future is going to be better than the past. We have to understand what time it is in the clock of the world and take our responsibility wherever we can. Okay, we've got one great question to wrap up, but I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, I want to make sure you get your copy of the Detroit City of Hope broadsheet, which uh, Grace and others have put a great deal of effort into. I want to remind you to join us at the Education People's Movement Assembly at 1 p.m. today in Kobo D2-15. And of course, to celebrate Grace's birthday party this evening uh, on the main level. Uh, I also want to say that I uh, think our panelists will be able to do some brief book signing. Um, I know Grace may not be able to write more than just her name uh, in the interest of time, uh, but there are books uh, available as well. Um, so thank you all. And the final question comes from Amber Duke from the University of Louisville. Are you here, Amber? <laughs> Amber wants to know, first of all, she says, happy birthday. <laughs> And she would like both of you to tell us, uh, can you reflect on what keeps you going? <laughs> Motivated and still struggling, what sustains you? And I think obviously young people want to know as they look forward to the struggle towards 2050 that they will be making. <laughs> what else can we possibly do? Well, I was very fortunate. I was born female. <laughs> I, my mother did not know how to read and write because there were no schools for her, for females in her little Chinese village. I, my father was very interested in education. I was a graduate student studying for my PhD and I came across Hegel. <laughs> <laughs> and I discovered Something that I think we all need to learn, particularly in the United States, that progress does not take place like a shot out of a pistol. It takes the labor, suffering, and the negative. And to how to use the negative as a way to advance the positive is our challenge to constantly recognize that we're not going to progress in a straight line, that linear progress is ridiculous, not real, but the labor and suffering of the negative enriches our concept of what is possible. And so in these very difficult times, what I see, there's so many fantastic things happening where people invent new ways of cooperating. The number of people who are coming here to Detroit and buying up rows of houses at something like eight or $10,000 each and beginning to live collectively is amazing. I, I'm not sure whether we have a real estate agency here for, but, but that's what people are doing, and particularly artists and young people. Because the, if you want to live by the system, you can't do it on your own. You have to sell out too much of yourself. And there are ways that you can take advantage of the economic stringencies 
to advance, to become more cooperative, to live more collectively, to cook together, to eat together, not to buy a car for everybody in the house. And you can bike, <laughs> as I know many of you have done in order to get here. These are so many things that we can do that will make us more human and at the same time help to create the new society, to create, you know, and, uh, what, what's the word? I don't, I don't know what I want. To begin to create the new society, because that's what we're all about. That's what our mission is, all of us. And on that note, I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience. What's very clear, what's very clear is that, when, that what has sustained Emmanuel Wallerstein and Grace Lee Boggs through over a hundred collective years are the movements that they've been a part of. So when we celebrate these two movement elders, Emmanuel Wallerstein and Grace Lee Boggs, these national traveler, treasures, we are celebrating all of the movements that have made the U.S. Social Forum and their work possible. 